Right, uh, moving right along in our discussion of the novels of Thomas Pynchon. Now we're up to Gravity's Rainbow, and this is the edition. It's quite hefty. Uh, this is the edition that I'm using with the, the Frank Miller uh, designed co cover. Frank Miller is one of my favorite uh, graphic novel uh, artists and writers. Um, so we'll be using this edition. And I am going to put my f the two videos that I did on Gravity's Rainbow before, a couple years back, into private mode to take them out of circulation and start over uh, so that everything is fresh. And I want these videos to flow out of the discussions of Pynchon's first two novels, V and The Crying of Lot 49, which I did not do uh, for that discussion uh, because I think it's important to see the continuities of the themes and the uh, images. Um, so Gravity's Rainbow then. Um, so this novel comes out in, uh, this is Pynchon's third novel. It comes out in 1973, I believe. Did I remember that right? 1973. It is the greatest novel, I think, written after World War II. I think uh, that Joyce's Ulysses and Finnegan's Wake, as I said in the previous, in, in that other video, are the two greatest novels of the first half of the 20th century. This is the greatest novel uh, of the second half, and I don't even think it has a, a runner-up. I don't even think it's a comparison. As great as novels like Blood Meridian are and so forth, they're, they're just not operating in this league. Um, this is this is Joyce's league, uh, league here. It, it's very complex. So this is divided now into four sections. Uh, part one is Beyond the Zero. Uh, part two is called Un Perm au Casino Hermann Goering, or a furlough, or a journey to the Hermann Goering Casino. Uh, and these chapter titles follow the peregrinations of Tyrone Slothrop across, from London across Europe. Um, uh, part three is called In the Zone, and then part four is The Counterforce. Um, each one of these has a series of what we might just call episodes. That's what Steven uh, Weisenberger calls them in his commentary to Gravity's Rainbow, which I highly recommend getting. Otherwise, you'll be lost. You won't make heads or tails. This is not a book you can just sit down and read. It doesn't work that way. You have to put effort into it, secondary sources, and, and do do the work uh, to, make it, to make it work. Otherwise, it, it's just... It reads like gobbledygook. I've heard people complain uh, that the novel is unreadable. It is only unreadable if you are not willing to put the work in to read it, just like you have to do with Ulysses or Finnegan's Wake. Read secondary sources. Bring them up. You're not going to get it sitting down just reading it off the top of, of, of your head. It's not going to work that way. Um, so hopefully these videos will be a contribution to helping people uh, with that uh, task. Um, so there's a total of what Weisenberger calls here um, episodes because he doesn't give the, the chapters within each of the four parts uh, titles or even call them chapters. They're just delimited by a series of, uh, what is it, uh, seven boxes. And um, there are 73 of these episodes total throughout the novel, um, but each one ha has a different length. The first uh, part one, Beyond the Zero, has 21 episodes, and there are 21 uh, cards in the major arcana of the tarot, uh, minus the Fool card, which is the Zero, uh, Beyond the Zero. And Tyrone Slothrop will appear in, in the uh, part four, the counterforce, in that role, as the, the, the role of the Fool. He goes through what Weisenberger calls eight different avatars, or eight different iterations of Slothrop, before he finally disappears in the counterforce forms around his memory. He becomes this mythical figure. He basically dissolves into myth and legend by the end of the book. He's the closest thing that the book does have to a main character, although I would not say uh, this is the realm of post-modernity when all the traditional literary structures are being melted down, plot, continuity, character, and so forth. Um, and though Slothrop comes the closest uh, to a main character, Pynchon isn't really necessarily fond of the, of the trope of have to, having to have a main character. He has a huge cast of characters, just as he does in Against the Day, uh, that is a novel with no main character at all. Uh, it's a collective assemblage of people uh, that is the character. Um, so all of this, um, so that's 21 episodes for part one. Uh, part two is eight episodes. Uh, part three has 32 episodes. And then part four has 12 episodes. So 73 episodes altogether. Each one of these is associated with a different sign of the Zodiac as well. Um, Part one uh, is associated with Pisces, not in terms of when it takes place. It takes place over nine days, 
uh, from, I think, December 18th to December 26th, 1944. So the novel itself covers the last nine months of the war, uh, from December to August of 45, uh, with the dropping of the bomb on Hiroshima. So the last nine months, and part one over that, over the 21 episodes covers uh, that period of nine days right in there, uh, which comes in chronologically on the calendar with the last three days of Sagittarius, who is the one who hurls the missiles. He, sh he has the bow and arrow, which is the first missile uh, that he sh fires, that the centaur fires, and then it shifts into Capricorn, the goatfish. But in terms of the imagery, um, uh, it's, it's Pisces, which has to do with death and dissolution and the paranormal. Uh, all that's in there. And then so part two is associated, more associated with Aries, and part three with Leo, uh, but then part four with Virgo. Now you would expect there to be a neat correspondence of one sign uh, per each of the four seasons, whereas we get with three and four, Leo and Virgo, which are both uh, summer signs. Um, so again, there's this postmodern penchant for asymmetries. Uh, things do not always come out in uh, nice, neat ways like they do in a Joyce novel. Um, so those are the primary images for each of the four parts. Um, so then now to a discussion of the book's title, Gravity's Rainbow. Uh, it was originally called Mindless Pleasures, which thank God he did not use. That's a terrible title. But Gravity's Rainbow is, is a great title. Um, and it contains uh, uh, within it, even within it, uh, an antinomy or a, a Pinchonian opposition between uh, fall and rise um, gravity, of course, all bodies fall. As Joyce points out in Ulysses, all bodies fall at the same constant rate of acceleration, 32 feet per second. And it refers to the, the arc of the missile, the V2 missile, which is the novel's primary image, uh, just as the whale is for Melville's Moby Dick, let's say, or the city is for James Joyce's Ulysses. Here it's the missile, the V2 missile. And it was the V2 missile uh, as designed by uh, Werner von Braun, uh, which got us into the space age. With, uh, so in a certain sense here, what Pynchon is doing is an archaeology of the space age. He's going back to its earliest origins in the imagination of, uh, of um, Werner von Braun. And uh, so gravity and then rainbow suggest rebirth because, so we have the fall with gravity and then the rebirth with rainbow because uh, the rainbow is what God sends to man after the flood, after he's wiped out uh, humanity with the flood. Then he sends the rainbow as a symbol, as a token uh, that he won't do this again. And he's made a new contract, a new covenant uh, with humanity. So it suggests restarting a world age. Uh, so we have the restart of a world age with the rainbow. The rainbow also, of course, refers to the, the Scandinavian uh, Bifrost, which is the rainbow bridge that connects the earth to Valhalla, which is the realm of the gods, Valhalla, but it's also uh, dead warriors are taken up by Valkyries to Valhalla. Uh, and only gods can go across the Rainbow Bridge, though. And of course, it also refers to the Greek uh, messenger goddess Iris, who is the Rainbow Goddess. Uh, she brings all the messengers. She performs the role in the Iliad that is performed by Hermes uh, as the messenger of the god in the Odyssey. So we have two different messengers there. Um, and of course, Gravity's Rainbow is the arc made the parabolic arc that is traced out in the sky by the V2 rocket. It's an arc. Um, and at certain points, it's described that the sunlight shines through the arc to make it iridescent. But in a theoretical way, uh, you could also say that in, in the opening episode, which we'll talk about in a second, uh, Pynchon uh, has the character Pirate Prentice there. Imagine that the parabolic arc would form a complete circle as it went underneath the earth to form a complete circle, which would uh, invoke these sort of fourfold mandala views of history, uh, like with the four yugas of the Indians, uh, the Hindu world, or uh, Hesiod's four world ages, the age of uh, the age of gold, and then silver, then bronze, and then iron. Those four ages, and the idea with that of the cyclical view of history repeating over and over and over again, but with uh, Zoroastrianism and its influence on the Hebrews, uh, the Hebrews, when they were taken into captivity, uh, spent some time in the Middle East being exposed to Zoroastrianism. And of course, uh, when they were restored to their homeland by Cyrus, uh, they picked up a lot of ideas, one of which is this idea of history as a single arc, uh, a non-repeatable arc in which things have not already happened over and over again, as they do in India with the concept of the, the four great Mahayugas, the Krita, the Trita, the Dubapara, and the Kali Yuga. 
but history has a, a, a beginning, a middle, and an ending, a genesis, a crucifixion, an apocalypse. It's a one-shot deal. And um, so, in a certain sense, Pynchon wants to invoke with this idea of the rainbow and its completion underneath the earth as a complete circle, uh, both models of history, because he's going to be working with both of them. He's got the Zodiac and lots of references to the Zodiac in here, uh, to Tarot, to Kabbalah, all kinds of stuff. And so uh, that's the significance of the title, Gravity's Rainbow. Um, and then, then uh, the novel covers then, uh, so the last nine months of the war, uh, and then uh, part one, Beyond the Zero, opens with a quote by Werner von Braun, uh, which though is taken, as Weisenberger says, it's actually taken from another text uh, that von Braun uh, is basically ripping off. Uh, let's see, what was the text? Um, Weisenberger qu uh, quotes it here because it's worth, uh, it, uh, Gravity's Rainbow begins with this epigraph uh, by von Braun. Nature does not know extinction. All it knows is transformation. Everything science has taught me and continues to teach me strengthens my belief in the continuity of our spiritual uh, existence after death. So von Braun believed in the afterlife and believed in the existence of the human soul. But that is actually taken from a text uh, from a book by William Nichols, Third Book of Words to Live By, 1962, uh, which has a text with an epigram by ben Benjamin Franklin. Uh, and the text is, Why I Believe in Immortality, but the epigram from Franklin reads, I believe that the soul of man is immortal and will be treated with justice in another life, respecting its conduct in this. Um, and then it proceeds to quote Nichols's, I presume that the author is this Nichols character, uh, William Nichols. And, um, and then it says, science has found that nothing can disappear without a trace. Nature does not know extinction. All it knows is transformation. Uh, like Goethe's famous couplet, uh, formation, transformation, the eternal minds, eternal recreation. Uh, now, if God applies this fundamental principle to the most minute and insignificant parts of his universe, doesn't it make sense to assume that he applies it also to the masterpiece of his creation, the human soul? I think it does. And everything that science has taught me and continues to teach me strengthens my belief in the continuity of our spiritual existence after death. Nothing disappears without a trace. So von Braun here has, has plagiarized from this text, obviously, because it's almost word for word. Uh, Beyond the Zero is the title then of part one, which is composed, as we have said, of 22 episodes and goes down to page 180 in the edition that I have. Um, Beyond the Zero refers to a couple of things. Um, if you go... If you, if you go down to zero and then go beyond zero, of course, you're going into the realm of negative numbers. Um, this would also be the realm of that non-visible completed missing half of the gravity rainbow arch uh, that the rocket traces out on its uh, tra trajectory. Uh, so there's that. And th but then it also refers to classical conditioning uh, where you get the stimulus response, like you ring the bell to get the dog to salivate uh, just before it gets food. So it associates the ringing of the bell with the getting of food uh, and then salivates and then pretty soon you can remove the stimulus uh, so that it go the stimulus goes down to zero. Um, so we'll be going beyond the zero. Classical conditioning will be a major idea in the novel, the attempt to program on the part of the military this character, uh, Tyrone Slothrop, uh, to control him. Uh, and the whole story will be about his breaking free of their classical conditioning uh, and controlling him uh, the same way they do, let's say, in A Clockwork Orange. Uh, where they take the Alex character and try to control him with a form of classical conditioning. They're doing the same thing to Tyrone Slothrop here, but he's going to break free of it. So that's the sort of heroic arc uh, that is traced here. Uh, so a little bit of background here on the development of the of the V2 rocket. Um, there are basically four founders of rocket science. Um, one Russian, one American, and then two Germans. Um, Sokovsky is the Russian. Uh, who f basically founded the idea, uh, wrote a paper in 1903 called the, uh, let's see, it's called the Exploration of Space with Reactive Devices. So he's the first to suggest that rockets could be used as uh, with reactive device uh, technology. Uh, and then we have Robert Goddard, the American, uh, who in 1919 wrote A Method of Reaching Extreme Altitudes, and in 1936 wrote Liquid Propellant Rocket Development. Uh, but he was... Whereas Tsiolkovsky and the other German here, Hermann Obert, 
were strictly theoreticians. Uh, and Obert wrote in 1923, The Rocket into Interplanetary Space, which was the first book to really suggest that uh, you could rockets could be designed. And all these men had read Vernon Wells. So they, their imaginations are fed on the transcendentalist myth of leaving the Earth behind and going out into space, leaving the mother behind, leaving the body of the mother behind. And so it should also be pointed out here at the beginning that uh, in a certain sense, this novel could have been subtitled V2. We've already gone through V, and we have seen that the central image of V is the vagina of the goddess. The V is the, stands for a vagina, as well as a bunch of other things, uh, but it is meant to represent the goddess and the disintegration and descent of the muse of Western civilization uh, through her identification with technology all through the uh, 20th century, uh, whereas the primary image here is, of course, the phallic rocket. And the phallic, it, it's obviously a phallic image, but it, it's even more so with the idea of leaving the earth behind, the silly fantasy uh, of leaving the earth behind to go and colonize, uh, you know, set up colonies on Mars, uh, like that's ever going to be done. <laughs> yeah, was, can you imagine the, the mental illness rates and the insanity uh, and the murders that would take place uh, with human beings in situations of that level of constant daily stress? that the human mind and body would be subjected to. These kinds of utopian uh, designers never think out the concrete details of what it would be like to actually put a human in such conditions uh, and what it would do the, to the human psyche, the, the amount of stress that's involved. Good luck even finding somebody who can survive on a, on a spaceship for that long, something like a year to get to Mars. Uh, good luck. Um, but uh, <clears throat> Obert was really the first to suggest that in this book, The Rocket into Interplanetary Space, uh, that a rocket could be built that could leave the atmosphere and that it could carry human beings on it and that it would pay for itself if the program was done correctly, uh, it would be self-financing. Uh, and this is the book that Werner von Braun read uh, early in his life and it inspired him. Obert became a kind of hero uh, for him and this is what he wanted to do. And the whole reason that von Braun became involved with the, the Nazi uh, uh, rocket program was not to hurl uh, missiles at London, but to go to the moon. Uh, that was his dream, to go to the moon and to colonize, uh, you know, the exoplanets and uh, the exosphere, just to get off the earth and go into outer space. That was his motivating dream, which is why he cooperated with the Nazis when they brought him in in the 1930s into their uh, rocket program. And then the, uh, the other guy, Robert Goddard, unlike these other two, who were only theoreticians, was not just a theoretician, but uh, an actual experimenter. He designed and flew the first rockets um, in Auburn, Massachusetts in 1926. He launched the world's first liquid fuel rocket. It successfully, it was 10 feet tall and it flew at 60 miles per hour, about 184 feet into the air. Um, and so uh, that had an influence on von Braun uh, in his interaction with the uh, German military, at first it's just the German military, before the Nazis have come in and seized power, the German military has set up this rocket program primarily because the Treaty of Versailles uh, at, at, after World War I outlawed, uh, made it illegal for the, the Germans to build up their munitions. Uh, so no more howitzers. Uh, but it didn't say anything about rockets. Uh, so they set their minds uh, to working on these rockets and the first rockets they worked on were the A1 rocket, which was a total failure, um, and the A2 rocket at a place called Kummersdorf. Um, and then they brought von Braun in to work on this. And uh, then the, the Nazis came in, of course, and then in 1937, they moved it to Peenemunde uh, on the island of Usedom. Uh, and Peenemunde was a place uh, suggested by von Braun's mother, which had been a place where his uncle or his grandfather, I forget, had, had used to go duck hunting. So the Nazis thought it was a good location. It's in the Baltic Sea. So they, they built this basically this rocket designing city. Uh, and at this point, they were up to designing the A3 uh, and getting ready to work on the A4. Uh, a stands for aggregate or assembly. Uh, so, and the A4 is another name for the V2. Uh, the V2 means uh, Vergeltungswaffe, uh, which, is, which means revenge weapon. Uh, Hitler had promised because of the Allied bombings the fire bombings of German cities, especially Lubeck, uh, which had been bombed in what, uh, let's see, 19, March 28th, 1942, uh, Lubeck was mercilessly firebombed, shamelessly as, as well, absolutely 
uh, unnecessary to, to do. And um, Hitler promised revenge weapons. Of course, uh, they'd already been working on the V-2 rocket since 1940 at Peinemunda, uh, but he, he promised this as a revenge weapon. Uh, and they firebombed uh, Hamburg, of course, July 24th, 1943, and then eventually uh, the firebombing of Dresden, which Pynchon will cover in this book because it takes place during his time frame here, February 13th, 1945. Um, so that's the reason for why these rockets in this program uh, had come into existence and why von Braun was brought in as the great genius. And von Braun is different than those other three in that he was both a theoretician and uh, an engineer. He was capable of actually designing these uh, rockets. So they start working at Peinemunda on the V-2 uh, missile. And the V-2 now, I should say, is designed on, on the island. Uh, the military has the, the Air Force on the western part of the island and the Army on the eastern parts. Uh, and the Army is designing the V-2 rocket, whereas the Air Force designs the V-1 rocket, which is called a buzz bomb because of the, the sort of sound it makes as it buzzes its way through the air. Uh, and it shows because the, if you look at pictures of the V-1 rocket, it looks like a, a, like a pilotless aircraft. It has wings and it's launched at a 45 degree angle. Uh, and they did successfully launch it at London on June 13th in 1944, but it just landed in a field. It didn't cause any harm, but it alarmed uh, the British uh, and they created a major evacuation of about half a million people. Uh, they thought the Nazis were just gonna wipe them out. Turns out that these rockets were not very efficient. Uh, they didn't really change the outcome of the war mu much. I think they fired, uh, they had ultimately 3,000 rockets sent against London um, and uh, only a thousand of those, um, only a thousand of those hit their targets and ended up killing like altogether 5,000 people. Uh, so it, it just didn't amount to much. Um, but uh, the British were terrified of it. It, it. it scared them quite a bit and um, which is what Hitler wanted. It, it was more of a terror weapon for him than anything else. Uh, but it came in too late to, to change the course of the war. Maybe if it had been developed earlier on, but it comes in right here at the tail end. Um, and then the first successful launch of a V-2 rocket is on uh, October 3rd, 1942. Uh, and on this rocket in particular, they ha had designed a logo of uh, Frau im Mond, uh, which was Fritz Lang's silent film that had been released, uh, The Woman in the Moon. Uh, and they have, you can look this up on uh, a Google image search, with the woman sitting on the moon uh, with the rocket behind her. And then this was the first successful launch of a V-2 rocket. Maybe the phallic aspect of the rocket uh, liked uh, the Frau im Mond <laughs> painted on the side of the, this rocket got it up. Um, uh, so this was, uh, and on this launch in 1942 uh, was when Dornberger said to uh, Von Braun, today we have just invented uh, the first spaceship. So, and it was indeed, the V-2 rocket was the first man-made projectile to actually uh, go to the top of the stratosphere, uh, right on the edge of, of space. Um, so it truly is, this is an archeology span of the space age that Pynchon is doing here, uh, going fathoming uh, its origins. Um, so then, so now uh, let's discuss then episode one here, which is very short, but very good. Uh, it's only a few pages. And the famous opening line, a screaming comes across the sky. One of the most famous lines of the history of literature, opening lines. Um, it has happened before, but there's nothing to compare to it now. It is too late. Uh, so we have the screaming, the sound of the rocket coming across the sky. The only problem is it's, it's too late once you've heard that because um, this was the first projectile to travel faster than the speed of sound. And so you wouldn't hear or see the rocket coming. You'd just be going about your business on Piccadilly Square, let's say, and all of a sudden uh, you'd be blown to pieces or there'd be an explosion, explosion across the street. Then you'd hear the sound. Uh, so cause and effect is reversed here. And Pinch is going to play around with this, that the, the rocket hits first, uh, then the sound comes after. So he gets into this idea of the inversion of cause and effect, which we know relativity does. Uh, Einsteinian relativity brings into question uh, the sequence of cause and effect in which the effect does not always necessarily have to follow uh, after the cause, which disrupts the whole history of sort of Newtonian mechanics and classical philosophical, especially German philosophical idealist thinking 
in which with a manual cot, let's say, cause and effect precede each other by necessity because it's part of the equipment of the way the human brain is organized that it filters phenomena that it experiences through its senses in that way. First the cause, then the effect. Not so in post-modernity. Uh, and so Pynchon is going to play around with that. Um, it's happened before. Uh, so the evacuation still proceeds, but it's all theater. The evacuation referring to the first V1, as we have mentioned, that landed in a field and caused half a million people to be evacuated. But now this is a dream that a character is having, uh, and the character's name is Pirate Prentice. Uh, he's a special ops guy who, who's one of these guys who, uh, whose job is to parachute into uh, German territory and find out whatever reconnaissance he can find out about the nature of the rockets or whatever the, his mission is. Uh, this becomes the OSS, which later becomes the CIA. So Pirate Prentice, and he's named Pirate uh, after a character in the Gil Gilbert and Sullivan uh, opera, uh, The Pirates of Penzance, um, where the, the pirate there is an apprentice to an older pirate. Um, so that's why he has the name. So he's having a dream here, or a nightmare, in which um, he's imagining that he's part of a group of very shabby, dispossessed individuals who are being herded on a conveyance through London, war-torn London with bombed out ruins everywhere. And now note that the imagery of the Praetorite here is right from the beginning. Pynchon's idea that we had seen in the crying of Lot 49, the concern with those uh, who are passed over. Um, you, you have with the Puritan sort of eschatology, the, the myth of the elect, um, those who are in the middle of society, those who run it, those who do the nine to five grind, uh, keep society going, and they're rewarded with money and marriage and whatever, uh, versus the Praetorite, who are the ones who are passed over. They become the disinherited. They become uh, the marginalized ones, uh, the bums, the homeless, the misfortunates, uh, the ones whom God has not favored. Those are the ones that uh, Pynchon is interested in here. Uh, and we saw Oedipamaz's concern with them in the crying of Lot 49, uh, as her primary revelation in the, uh, the last uh, chapter of that novel, um, or the second to last, when she's going through San Francisco at night, seeing the Praetorite everywhere in association with this underground organization called the Tristero. Here it seeks right into the Praetorite, where he's describing uh, this group uh, that Pyrus Prentiss is with, um, who are basically refugees from these bombing uh, runs by the missiles, um, and then there's a lot of apocalyptic imagery. One gets the sense that this is the last judgment. Uh, this is kind of a very last, it has a very apocalyptic feel to it, the imagery here. Um, and there's a lot of apocalyptic imagery in this novel. It very much does concern uh, the idea for Pynchon that World War II was a kind of a apocalyptic war, and even worse because its ultimate product was the atom bomb could lead to a true, actual apocalypse. And he's Pynchon is concerned about that. So this is one of the reasons why um, he's tracing the origins of the missile that becomes the ICBM, the Intercontinental Ballistic Missile that, could, uh, that carries the nuclear warheads later on. Um, so he's a captain, Captain Jeffrey Pirate Prentice, and he wakes up. And he's in uh, what's called a maisonette, which is basically just a kind of uh, cottage. Um, and the guy up above him, um, they're, they're, somebody has kicked out the balusters uh, and there, there's a guy sleeping on a Teddy Bloat, as, as his name is, is sleeping up above him. And he's starting to roll over and Prentice, with his, uh, oh, with his uh, special ops reflexes, sees this very quickly, jumps out of his cot, pushes it back and catches Teddy Bloat right when he falls down onto the cot and looks up and then goes right back to sleep. Uh, so it catches him uh, just in time uh, as he's waking up from his uh, apocalyptic dream here. Um, and then, uh, so now Pirate Prentice has concerned himself with making everyone fried banana sandwiches and uh, fried banana this and fried banana that. Uh, he's gotten f from somehow with a contact from uh, Rio de Janeiro, he's managed to get uh, bananas and he's got them in a hothouse up at the top. So he has to go up this uh, staircase uh, to the roof, which he does. This is before the sun has risen. And I believe this is December 18th, uh, so we're on the, uh, the last um, period of Advent, which is just before the Advent calendar. Advent means parousia, which refers to the second coming of Christ, uh, just before the, the nativity. 
Um, and this is before dawn, so the sky is still dark. So Pirate goes up there, and he's got a hothouse there uh, where he's going to go in in a minute and get a bunch of bananas uh, for to make everybody breakfast. And so there's a direct allusion here, of course, to the first chapter of Joyce's Ulysses uh, with Buck Mulligan ascending in the, the gun tower that they're living in, um, going up the steps right at the beginning to do a, a sort of parody of the mass uh, as, a, as a shave. And uh, here, uh, Prentice goes to the top of the roof. He's taking a piss and he's looking out and he sees to the east uh, what looks like a new star. And he looks over at it and he's, he's thinking, that definitely looks like a new star. So, of course, Pynchon is playing here with the idea of this, the star of Bethlehem. Uh, there's a reason why this, he sets this right around Christmas with the star of Bethlehem, except that it's not. It's a man-made star. It's one of the Nazis lo launching a V-2 rocket from The Hague, which is where they have mobile launch pads uh, in The Hague that they're, they're launching these rockets from. And uh, it take, they have a range of about 250 miles, and it takes them about five minutes. Uh, to make it across from the Netherlands uh, to London. Um, so he sees, he sees the rocket, he sees it approaching, and he's wondering what he should do, because uh, there's nothing he really can do. Uh, the rocket's already been launched, and it's going to hit somewhere in, in, in London, and it's absolutely inevitable. So he's standing there, and he thinks, oh, I'll just go get some bananas. So he goes into the hot house and fills up his uh, bathrobe with a whole bunch of bananas, uh, and then he carries them uh, back down below, um, where he's going to make everybody breakfast from these bananas. And uh, he knows that the, the rocket is going to hit somewhere, uh, but there's no, no telling where it's going to hit. It turns out that uh, one of the main jokes of the novel is that Tyrone Slothrop's sexual conquests, uh, he always has one at a site just before one of the rockets hits. And so the military wants to use his sexual conquests to create a distribution map so they can predict uh, when and where one of these uh, V-2 missiles is going to hit. Um, it's <laughs> so it's phallic imagery all the way here. You can make as many uh, phallic jokes as you want. Uh, Pynchon would encourage all of them because it is a novel about the phallus. Um, and uh, all right, so that's how it opens up. Uh, we'll leave it there for the introduction to Gravity's Rainbow.